Okay. All right. Hello, welcome to Goodreads with Nancy Lord. Uh, Nancy is an author of many literary fiction and nonfiction works. In addition to being an accomplished writer, she is also an editor and reviews books for the Anchorage Daily News. And as if she's not got enough going on, she also has been a, has taught at the University of Alaska Anchorage and Johns Hopkins. She enjoys being outdoors and playing pickleball in her spare time, a hobby many of you share with her. Um, and so please help me in welcoming Nancy Lord. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Leslie, for that, for that uh, 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 introduction. So um, yeah, because there are so few of you, why don't we take a minute just to um, hear a little about you, if you want to just say your names and maybe tell me one thing that you'd like me to know about yourselves. And I, we can just go across my screen if you want, which would be Lynn and Ron first. Let me unmute. Um, okay, I'm Lynn Larson, and I um, recruited you because I was really interested in your writing about science. And I'm retired. I used to be a school teacher, and I'm now a painter. I had an art degree. So, um, haven't spent much time in Homer, your area of the world. So um, I, uh, I uh, am really interested in a lot of the authors that you seem to have down there. You seem to have an abundance of writers. So, okay, Ron, you're on. Yeah, Ron Arnell, a uh, retired wilderness guide, did a lot of trips in the Brooks Range and elsewhere in Alaska. Uh, just interested in nature writing and the process. Great, good. Okay, how about Alice? Um, I'm Alice Tickney, and I'm a retired wildlife biologist who's, who started her career as a subsistence researcher out in the bush. Um, so most of my writing has been scientific writing, but I always appreciate um, science writing that is aimed at the general public and is easy to um, read and, and read at night and not dry and aimed at journals. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and who is that, uh, D -D -D Darlene? Hi, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> I'm an artist, but um, to make my living, I worked in the sciences up at the university and I've enjoyed your writing. So I was pretty excited that you were going to do a presentation. I'm also retired. <laughs> okay, all right, and K Carol. I'm um, Caroline Wolf, and um, Caroline, okay. former um, lived in the bush for many, many years. And I love listening to Alaska writers because I'm always learning new things. All right, and then we have Mary. Hi, hi, Nancy. Hi, my name's Mary Matthews, and um, I'm I'm real involved with aging at home, which isn't really the reason I'm here. I'm a I'm an avid reader. I read a lot, but I'm way behind on my Alaska readers. And I have to admit, I have not read your thing. So I am uh, looking forward to learning about you and about your writing. So thank you for being here. Okay, well, you're welcome. So um, uh, I thought I would just start by uh, sharing my screen and showing you a few slides. Um, where did it go? Where did it go? There it is. Okay, everyone can see that. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm in I'm in Homer, and um, this is this is just a few slides I put together for another group, some students from um, somewhere on the East Coast. So um, kind of a little introduction to Alaska, but this is this is one of my favorite places in the world. Which uh, it's across from Homer uh, on the other side of Kachemak Bay. It's kind of it's a place you can only get into it high tide I'm not even I don't even want to tell you where it is <laughs> it's kind of a secret slew uh, it's full of eel grass it's an incredible habitat area full of baby salmon and you know birds in there and uh, anyway I like to take my kayak in there so I'm just going to run through the heat these and just tell you a few 
things. And th these are all kind of related to things I've written about. Um, one of my books, uh, Green Alaska, is about the Harriman expedition of 1899. And this is a map that was drawn by members of that expedition. Um, and But it shows the route where they came up from um, Seattle and then along the coast and up through the Bering Sea over to Russia and, and back. Um, and the arrow, of course, I'm just pointing out where Homer is. Um, so I wrote I wrote a book that was kind of reimagining their journey and comparing uh, uh, some of the places and situations in the you know, 100 years later, because I published this in uh, uh, 1999, my book. Um, but it was after that that I actually got got hired by a couple of different uh, adventure cruise ships to retrace the expedition. So I did that for several years and got to got to go to all these fabulous pieces places, you know, out the out to Dutch Harbor and up through the um, uh, Pribilof Islands and St. Matthew Islands and over to Russia and and then back towards uh, towards Nome. Um, so I had some really fun fun years uh, uh, doing that as a result of writing that book. Uh, picture of uh, Homer, I imagine you've all been to Homer at one time or another. This is from the hill behind my house, looking down on Beluga, Beluga Lake and then the Homer spit in the mountains, mountains across the way in the fall, which is uh, try to every, every fall, I <laughs> hike up the hill and take a photo like that. Uh, and of course, this is the Homer Beach, what it looks like right now in the in the winter when the things ice up. Still, beautiful place. I'm happy to happy and lucky to live there. This is our library. I hope some of you have been to Homer's library. I still call it the new library, but it's uh, gosh, it's 15 years old now, um, and uh, kind of designed like a uh you know telescope kind of looking looking across to the glaciers across the bay but um we're very proud of our proud of our library and big big supporter so uh, one of my first books is called fish camp and it's about the uh the place and the kind of the human and cultural history and personal history that surrounds the 25 years i spent fishing on the west side of Cook Inlet, setting it fishing over there. And this was our second cabin. The first cabin was over here where this old platform is. It ended up falling into the ocean at one point, eventually. Um, but uh, area that I'm uh, very, very uh, attached to and, and we don't have the cabin or the fishing operation anymore, but um, those, were, those were good years. Um, this is not my photo, but um, one of my books is called Beluga Days, and it's about the Cook Inlet uh, belugas, and it's sort of meant to be a, it's meant to be not just about those belugas, but kind of a, um, a, a, a learning, uh, a, a way to think about our marine mammal management more, and our relationships with uh, animals, the animal world more broadly. Um, so this is obviously a, a, a mature female and a very young uh, uh, beluga. And um, even though that book was from 2004, I think, um, I still stay kind of engaged with that topic there. You know, they became um, listed as endangered and they have not recovered. Uh, their kind of population is kind of stable at about about 300 in, in Cook Inlet. Um, another favorite place of mine is uh, the McNeil Bear Sanctuary. Uh, I imagine some of you have probably been over there. I think I've been there five five times. And I've always, you know, I always give myself kind of a writing assignment when I go, an essay or short story most recently, or, you know, some something um, so that I can, uh, you know, take notes and think about think about that amazing place and our, again, our relationships with, with animals. Um, um, I'd like to go away to do uh, artist residencies and I've done a number of them in, in um, kind of wild places, including uh, one in Denali National Park. Um, and this, this is um, 
this is a dinosaur fossil, a, a footprint. Um, and I got to spend um, a day up in the mountains with some dinosaur experts who were searching for these uh, fossils and documenting them, making, um, uh, what do you call, imprints of them um, and uh, molds, molds of them. Um, and anyway, so I ended up writing a writing an essay about um, you know dinosaurs in Denali Park. It was at the this was quite a few years ago, and at the time it was still kind of news that there had been you know dinosaurs in that part of the world. Um, and then you they, the essay that I wrote they use there now for uh, education uh, purposes. Um, and I also wrote some poems while I was there too, which are at the at the visitor center. Um, another uh, residency I did was in uh, Prince William Sound. I did this with a, a friend who's a, a photographer. So we went there together. We were we were up in Harriman Fjord related to the Harriman expedition. Um, and uh, John Muir had been in there when, when he was there as part of that expedition. And we kind of retraced where he'd spent time. He was sort of left off there with his own little group for several days while the expedition went elsewhere. Um, and so we kind of traced around the, pla the places that he'd mentioned in his journals and the, the drawings that he'd made of the different glaciers, uh, which was a fun, fun project. And we did, we did some, you know, writings together. We did a, um, uh, a, a video essay too with her photos and sound and my, my words. Um, and, then, and then with the same, photographer, uh, her name's Irene Owsley, she's from Santa Fe. Uh, we, uh, we, tried, we did another residency with the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, which is headquartered in Homer. We went out to uh, Kiska and uh, Attu Islands um, on the 75th anniversary of the, um, uh, the Japanese, Japanese invasion. And then the next year was the Battle of, of Attu. Um, and again, we were we were sort of documenting, and we I wrote a number of pieces um, about um, about being out there. And again, it was you know not it was trying to sort of add creativity to the understanding of what that what that place is, what and the the legacy of the war out there. I think you all know that you know. The islands out there were part part of World War II. People out in the rest of the country still don't aren't that aware of that that the Japanese had invaded and were there for about a year. Um, and then this is this is when I was aboard um, a research ship. Uh, I wrote a book about climate change called um, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, anyway, um, and then uh, because of that book, one of the scientists I worked with uh, said, well, we should get you out on a research ship. So they got me an invitation to spend, <clears throat> I think it was 10 days in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, and then that became the basis for, I wrote an essay, but I also wrote a novel that's called PH. Um, so fiction that starts out on a ship like this. And I, you know, invented the characters and so on, invented a kind of a crisis that they went through to make to make it try to give it a good story. And then um, this is the last slide. And this is the last res artist residency I had. It was in Wales, which is where one of my grandmothers came from. So I felt I was really sort of interested in exploring, exploring whether there was sort of some kind of like genetic memory or something. And I, I certainly felt that way when I got there. Uh, it just felt so much like I was where I belonged. I just loved it there. And I, and I had planned to go back the next year and then COVID came along and I haven't gotten back. But this is a little village called called uh, Chorus, kind of in uh, central north, between the between central Wales and north Wales. And, um, and this is uh, just a hike that some of us took uh, nearby, nearby there, but just love that place. So I think that that's the end of that. I will stop sharing uh, and come back to us. So um, 
uh, I didn't really uh, prepare a lot more to say to you. I, um, so I'd rather hear what your questions are, um, talk to you. And then I did bring along uh, a couple of very short writings. I could read one or both if we have time. Um, so, but why don't we open it for questions, Leslie, if you wanna manage that. Um, I don't, you know, if, I think you can just unmute and speak if you, whatever you would like to know. I have a question, about. Nancy. Yeah. Um, were you on that Harriman ex expedition with Kessinat that when they, it was like, I don't know if it was a centennial of it. Were you on that boat then? I was okay. not. They were, they were the, the oh. first, yeah, the first retracing was two, I think it was 2000 or 2001. It was not on the 100th. And I had already written and published my book. And that trip okay. was sponsored by Smith College. And I tried to get an invitation <laughs> to be part of it, along with Kess and others. Um, uh, Richard Nelson was one of the writers who was involved, and Sheila Nickerson was the poet. So they tried to kind of, you know, the original Harriman expedition had writers and artists and scientists. And so they were trying to kind of replicate the, the makeup. Um, and anyway, um, so I was not part of that, but then the next year, the, the company that they charted with, which was Zagram Expeditions and the Clipper Odyssey, they did the same trip again and for two or three more years. And so they hired me to be their historian. And um, so I did, and that was uh, 2001 through 2006, I worked for them and then for another company that with the same itinerary, so. What was the yeah. name of the com company? It was called Zagram. They're out of business Zagram. now. And the ship was called oh. the Clipper Odyssey. And it's also gone. I think it works in Antarctica now, works somewhere else. And then I worked also for Cruise West on the same itinerary. They're also out of business. <laughs> they also went belly up. Um, and uh, and uh, that was another ship that was the spirit of Oceanus. But those were those were fun times. I really enjoyed, um, really enjoyed the my colleagues that I worked with on those ships, and, and I generally enjoyed the passengers. It's small ships, you know, maybe two hundred people. And uh, we does anybody do those kind of places. tours? Huh? Does anybody does anybody do those kind of tours nowadays? Like, yeah, they yeah, the they're just picking up again. And um, Out of the Arctic, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, Lindblad. Uh, Lind Lindblad. I was actually supposed to do a Lindblad trip in 20 2000, and then in 2001, there was the Bering Sea trip, um, and they were both canceled because of COVID, and then and then they're not not doing them. But um, yeah, I think if you if you Google uh, Alaska cruise Bering Sea, there are, there are some other companies that are. That are picking up that that route. It's a very challenge. It's very. I mean, you can imagine. It's very challenging. Even in the summer, the weather out there, we couldn't always, you know, we couldn't always get ashore because you know we we tried to stop in villages and 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 just <coughs> you know wild places where there you know there are no docks. You can't couldn't just pull up to a dock, and so we would you know offload onto zodiacs. Go with sure I was a Zodiac driver too, and I'm not that great. <laughs> uh, so I was always very nervous about landing and, you know, when they were, you know, breaking waves on the shore, trying to get people on and off boats. Um, so, yeah, so there were times when we couldn't, I mean, I remember one time when we couldn't get to the, either of the Pribilof Islands, it was just too stormy and passing, you know, there were passengers who really wanted to get there and they were not very happy when we couldn't. But yeah. Nancy, I'm uh, interested in um, how you got started as a writer. Have you been always writing or what, what got you into the, into the field of being, being a writer? What, what was your sort yeah. of history? Yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't really study writing um, as a young person. I really, I started writing. I came to Alaska out of college, so I was I was twenty. Uh, moved to Homer, and I, I think writing was um, my way of of um, educating myself, or kind of kind of 
thinking about where I was and what I was learning. So I was using writing as a way to process my own learning. And initially I was writing short stories. So I had a couple of short story collections published. And I think that was, that was because I didn't think I knew enough or had authority to write nonfiction. So I, but I thought I could make things up. So I, I was initially writing, <laughs> writing fiction. And then I was starting to write some sort of essays. And, it, and at one point, that's when it kind of clicked to me, like if I pull these together and add to them, I could actually have a book. And that's what became my book, Fish Camp. Um, and, then I, and then I just kept, just kept writing. And I went, well, actually, yeah, I went, I went back to school to study writing um, and got an MFA degree in the, in the 80s. Um, and, uh, and then I never thought I wanted to teach. That wasn't on my radar at all, but the director of the college and Homer kept asking me if I would teach. And so one year I said, yes. <laughs> and, um, and then I just started teaching there. I really loved it. I did some teaching in Anchorage in the MFA program there. Um, uh, and then I taught in the, yeah, the Anchorage low residency MFA program that just ended. It was just killed by budget cuts. Um, so I did that for, I, I don't know what, what it was, 15 years. And then I've been teaching in this Johns Hopkins program for about six, six years now, which is specifically, you know, nonfiction science writing. Yeah. So what else would you like to know? I, yeah. I, I have questions about pH, the book, the novel you wrote. Sure. Okay. Um, but well, first of all, I'm just interested, like, why did you suddenly do a novel? Because I think that was your first novel. Yeah. Well, wasn't the first one that I'd written. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I think it was, actually, okay. I think I've got like four that are in the drawer that, because I'm not, okay. I'm not very um, plot oriented or not, you know, or even not, not really that imaginative. I don't, you know. Um, so, so yeah, I, so I, I mentioned I'd written a book about climate change. It's called Early Warming, that book. Um, and, um, uh, and it didn't, uh, you know, it, there had already, there had already been a lot of books about climate change. And so I, I, my, it was my agent who was, encouraging me to write a climate change book. And I kept telling her, you know, it's, there had already, you know, everyone, it's already been done. I kept saying, you know, and this was in the, this was a long time ago. Um, and, but then I thought, well, maybe I could tell a story, not, a, not that it's happening, but how people and communities in Alaska are adapting because we were, see, you know, we were experiencing it, you know, first and in kind of obvious ways and people were, adapting. Um, so that was a story I tried to tell, thinking that it could kind of prove a prove helpful to people everywhere if they could see how how people were adjusting. Um, but it didn't it didn't really uh, make much of a mark in the publishing world. Um, so that's when I thought, well, what if I tried to tell um, a related story, but in in a, a more compelling story, you know, with a plot, with characters that were interesting or more interesting, you know, and that would they were there was conflict and, you know, so um, so that's what, and then and then I had that opportunity to be on the um, the cruise, the ocean oceanography cruise, uh, so I could draw on that. And then, as you noticed, I I set um, I set a lot of it in Fairbanks at the university there. I, I just I call it the University of the North, um, and um, uh, so uh, I don't know. You know, the characters are imaginary, but people always think that they that they that they're based on you know one person or another, and I get that all the time. Oh, oh there's so and so, and you know, not really. <laughs> um, well, but you they know, were very I'd be, I'd be curious what what. What uh, what interested you about that, or what other what further questions you have? Well, I, I didn't really know a lot about acidifications, so it you know it made me look up some things and some research in that on that. So 
you know, so you successfully taught somebody about acidification in a roundabout way. Um, I did like the characters, and I'm more of a, a um, nonfiction reader, so, um, or excuse me, a fiction reader than a nonfiction reader. So it was, you could hook me better with giving me characters and their plot. My friend uh, and I, we were wondering about what was happening up at the university here. We're going, is this based on any type of little <laughs> scandal that's ever happened up there? And of course it was like, oh, what is this, you know? So, um, so where did you come up for, with that idea? Yeah, it, 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 from different sources. Um, uh, of course, you know about the, um, um, what was it called? The, the you know, the, the plan to blow up the harbor out of Fort, out, out of right. Fort. Yeah. And you mentioned that in the book. Yeah. Yeah. So I I had read that uh, written by a, a Dan, Dan O'Neill, his book. Um, and and there was some there was some stuff that happened at the university at that time, you know, that was uh, very questionable, questionable. Um, so I, I kind of tried to, uh, you know, apply that to, you know, my, my, this situation that I was imagining. And then just what I know about you know, I've never been an academic, but I've been around enough, um, you know, university people to sort of know how 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 those how those things go, the pressures that are put on people to speak or not speak, and and then um, and then I did a lot of I did a lot of research on um, uh, you know geoengineering, different ways that people might try to deal with acidification by you know adding iron iron filings or you know using limestone these kind of things there are a lot of ideas that have come up so some of that is sort of you know science based but not not practical um so i brought that into the story and I, you know i felt like i needed to have a villain so i do have the villainous guy and then but I've I've, oh, yeah. I've kind of regretted that because he's very he's very one-dimensional and I'm I'm sorry that I didn't make him you know give him more roundedness and in, in, in fullness as a, a you know a better a, a, per, a more complicated person he's kind of a cardboard foil for the good guys so if I were if I were rewriting I would I would change that and then the research that I was able to find online easily, um, it sounded like a lot of the studies about the acidification, it was off like British um, Columbia and that, is that true? And I don't know if I was finding ones that were done off places in Alaska. Well, there- I mean, you had it in Alaska. Yeah, no, there's, there have been so many uh, studies now all over, all over the world. Um, a lot of them along the west coast of the states, um, in, in in both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic um, oceans, um, uh, and then and then within within labs. Of course, a lot of a lot of it early on was in labs where they were just you know changing changing pHs to see what would happen to different critters. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, and then, you know, now they've got all kinds of, you know, they've got autonomous vehicles and stuff that can go out and test the waters and, you know, collect, you know, do sampling. And um, it's really advanced a lot since, you know, even since I wrote that book, which was what, 2017 when it was published. So we're way ahead of that. In fact, I think I mentioned in the book that the, um, uh, the, the CO2 level was I am I was trying to I was trying to as I was writing the book I was trying to make it a little bit um, speculative, trying to I was trying to push it out a little in front of where we already were, but the reality kept catching up to me. I mean things kept sort of getting worse than they'd been projected to be. We kind of I kept sort of overtaking my imaginings, and and when I finally ended I I. I said something about the pH level being, I don't know what I said it at, 208 or something parts per million. And it's way above that now. Um, so um, yeah, so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not futuristic it's all, at all. It's kind of historic <laughs> in terms of the situation, but 
yeah, there's yeah, there's uh, there's a there's a network. Um, there's an Alaska network of people working on uh, acidification, and I don't remember the name of it. I think it's the you know ocean acidification network, something like that. I'm sure you could find it. Um, and they they've got a lot of handouts and you know materials that they prepared for the public. Nancy, um, yeah. you've written a lot of books and collections and had a lot of different experiences. What was um, like the most fun to write collection or book? Like what was your favorite one that you had the most fun writing? Yeah, my, my favorite is that one about the Harriman expedition, you know, green, green Alaska, because um, it was just fun to learn about that expedition and uh, and then to imagine and, and to visit some of the same places and um, you know Im imagine things and you know I did a lot of research and I wrote that really before the internet was was up so I you know I I I, I went to um, you know I did a lot of book research and went I went to actually went to the Smithsonian in Washington D.C. to look up the look up photos and journal entries from the from the expedition. You know, you can get all that stuff online now, um, but it was just fun. And then, and then it's also it's written in kind of very small, small chapters that are um, kind of impressionistic. And I really enjoyed writing in that form because I just kind of wrote them as they, you know, as I was inspired to, as I learned something new, and then I would write it, and then I assemb I assembled them all at a later date. So it was just written in piecemeal in a in just in a very fun way. Um, and then it was a bonus that I actually ended up getting to go to all, getting to all, go out to all the places as you know on the cruise ships. It didn't I had not something I had planned or expected to happen. Um, a quick follow-up question I have for you is um what's like one topic in science or you know history that you um, haven't written about that you'd like to write about? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about everything. Oh, I should, I should, yeah, I should mention, um, I'm really interested in neuroscience, how the, how the brain works. There's so much new science going on in that area. Um, and so I, re I recently had a, um, residency that I forgot to mention um, just in um, in October um, at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab on Long Island, which is a uh, science lab where they do a cellular research in neuroscience and in cancer research. Those are the kind of the two main areas. And in my application there, I had said I was really interested in neuroscience and I mentioned specifically, I was wanted to learn more about how the brain processes information and why 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 belief seems to be stronger than logic, mm. uh, just because of you know the what we see in politics where people kind of get so convinced in in their belief systems that you can't talk them can't talk them out of them. And it's true that you know these things are processed in different parts of the brain. Anyway, I wanted to learn about that, so I got I had this residency. I was accepted for it, and then I got there, and the science was so overwhelming to me because I don't have that, I don't really have any science background really, um, and it was all so I you know I would it was they have all these labs there and all these people and they give they're constantly giving, they they have classes and workshops and meetings and they're giving these talks you know like powerpoint talks and and i couldn't i just couldn't i couldn't understand a word so i went to a few of those i, I had this idea in mind and anyway i learned i learned that um that it's too, it's too much for me so i couldn't i couldn't really um couldn't really do what i had hoped to do um, which I think I'm I'm kind of more interested in the psychology aspects of <laughs> those things rather than the, what the cells are doing. Um, I mean, I can just barely understand that, you know, how the neurons work, you know, they're kind of 
talking to each other and <laughs> they're all connected. But getting beyond that and uh, is is too much. But I still I'm I'm still I think neuroscience is an area I'm really interested in. But I have to figure out you know how to process it. And I've you know I've written I've written a couple things uh, related to my my parents because they both had dementia in their when they were older, and um, and I was really sort of interested in how that manifested you know, what, what they were, when my father was losing his ability to talk and how he would kind of try to circumvent that. Um, and and that that's kind of what got me so interested in, you know, what's, what the heck is going on with the brain when the neurons are getting blocked or, you know, whatever's happening there. So, yeah, good question. Thank you for that. How, how do you get these residencies, Nancy? Like, what's that process like? Do you apply for them? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, there, there are a lot of um, sort of artist colonies around the country and the world. And those are the ones I've mostly done where you, you, you apply, if you get accepted, you go and you, you, you just do your work there. And there's sort of no expectations of what, you know, you don't need to you don't need to like deliver a product or anything, um, but more more recently I've been doing these um, uh, these other kinds of residencies that are really intended to uh, help um, institutions or or um, uh, you know parks and refuges. Um, help get information out to the public in creative ways. So, so I've been applying for those. There's a, there's a program called, um, what is it called? Um, I can't see my desktop. Uh, there's a program where a number of the parks and national forests and refuges in, um, in Alaska come together and they, off, they offer these to artists and, you, and, and you apply. Um, and so, yeah, so I had done that one in Prince William Sound, one in the, in the Aleutians. Um, and um, what else have I done? Oh, I did one in Oregon with the, uh, uh, with the experimental forest down there, Andrews Experimental Forest. And again, it was that, it was that same idea where they would, they'd pair you up with scientists working in the forest that, so you could kind of accompany them. So, you know, I spent a day like trapping small mammals and uh, and then also just you know visited all these experimental sites and learning about um, owls and uh, anyway so um, yeah there there are um, there's an organization called the Alliance of Artist Communities that lists lots of these places mostly mostly the huge the kind of uh, artist colony places. Um, and then I just keep my eyes open for, you know, anything else. And this one that I went to in, on Long Island was brand new. I didn't even know that. I just, I saw it listed somewhere and I said, oh, that sounds like, you know, it'd be good for me because I, you know, I thought I had pretty good, you know, credentials and because I was teaching science writing and all. So, so um, I applied and got in. And then when I got there, they said, well, you're, you're the first one. <laughs> and, and I said, oh, really? Uh -oh. <laughs> and then it turned out that there, there was actually one before me. There was a, a playwright who would come before me. So I was the second one, um, but it was a very new program. And it was just because I was kind of alert, kind of watching what popped up um, to, you know, and I think because it was new, they didn't have as many applicants because these are really pretty competitive. Um, actually, the one, one that I was just recently rejected from, um, they had a, a hundred and no, no, excuse me. They had 750 applicants for 30 places. So, you know, it's just, it's hard. And then, and that, and then actually the one that, the one in Wales that I went to was actually, I had to, I had to pay a small amount of money um, to do that one. It wasn't, um, you know, most, most I usually try to go to places that, that I don't have to pay for. And ideally, where they they also provide the food, I'd love to be fed, not have to worry about that. 
Yeah. Do you sometimes just travel with scientists though and it's not a residency? Because I know the book I'm reading, you were at Eisenbach and you were in Russia fishing. And it, it did sound like yeah. either one of those, or some of the other situations in that book were residencies. It sounded like you somehow just made friendships or yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah. I just I try to take advantage of any any opportunity, and it's kind of it's because I'm kind of you know I'm from New England. I've kind of got a um, you know I don't know Calvinistic approach to to things, so I don't like I don't I never take a vacation. But vacations, you know, the idea of going somewhere to sit on a beach, you know, I'm you know that's not me. So if I'm going to go somewhere, like if I'm going to go over to the McNeil Game Sanctuary. It's because I'm going. I'm. Ha I've ha I'm hatching out some writing idea that I'm going to work on. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I would. I just noted uh, the other day. You know, now that the Mauna Loa is uh, having the eruption, um, yeah. that that appears in my, in my, um, yeah. in PH, because I did go there to visit a friend and and kind of have a vacation, oh. but I had writing in mind. So I gave that, I gave a Hawaii vacation to my character and he went up Mauna Loa to see the, uh, the, the Keeler curve, Keeling curve with the instruments where they've been doing all that, which, so I did that. I was really interested in doing that because of my interest in climate change. So I went there, took lots of notes, and gave it to my character. And then like the Eisenbeck piece that you read, that was actually an assignment from uh, Sierra Magazine, I think, um, to go out there, and then and then I think they, I can't remember what happened. They either, they killed it or something, and so I, it, it ended up actually being in a, in another magazine. Um, but that was the that was the impetus for that was kind of a you know, a magazine assignment, and then um, yeah, so I mean because these things are. I don't usually get I don't usually get assignments or or you know book advances that are enough to do anything. So like, like with my book Early Warming, I just took advantage of um, uh, whatever I could to get to places in the north. So I had friends who were teaching in Kaktovik, so I went up to visit them and spent you know I don't know a week in Kaktovik and used that as one of my places. And then I don't know if any of you knew. Uh, Craig Gerlach, he was an uh, mm -hmm. anthropology yeah. teacher at the university. No, Craig. Uh, he he invited me to go with him to Fort Yukon, um, and because uh, he was doing work there related to you know gardening and as as a response to climate change, and so I went there with him. Just took advantage of that invitation, um, especially if you're going to uh, native villages, mm -hmm. you can't just pop in. Yeah. You have to. You have to have some reason to be there. <laughs> so um, trying to think. Yeah, so things like that. Yeah. So what I know you mostly for is your reviews. Oh. And I usually always read your reviews and you've been well and, and your poetry too. And I think I remember, I think one of the first pieces of yours I read was like a review of um, whoever he was like the first poet laureate of Alaska that I knew about from my t time here I'm trying to remember anyway um anyway so I'm always like you know trying to think of whether I want to read a book or not so I always like to see if there's a review of it, especially from an Alaskan author so how did you get into that because David yeah. James does that as well. Yes, he does. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. David and I are, are good, good, good colleagues. We trade our lists back and forth, and you know, <laughs> so on. Re recommend book books to one another. Um, uh, yeah, that was probably John Straley. Um, probably his because I've, I've reviewed oh, right. yes. most of his most of his books. In fact, he's got a new book out, and I'll be reviewing it in January. A new a new mystery. Um, how did I, I don't, I've, I've always written, I've always written uh, reviews here, here and there. And um, it was when, it was when the Anchorage paper, it was 
2014 or 2015 when the Anchorage paper was the Alaska Dispatch News, and they had they had resurrected the We Alaskans section, and mm -hmm. the editors there asked me if I would like to be a reviewer. And, and so at, the, at that time I said, well, I could do one review a month. So for a year or two, I only, I did one, you know, one review a month. And then, and then anyway, the magazine section went away, but the, the editor at the Anchorage paper now, David Hewlin really is a big supporter of, of books, book reviews, because hardly any newspapers carry book reviews anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's he's continued um, continued that and and I I really you know it's not you know the pay is <laughs> minimal um, but I, I like doing it I mean I like bringing attention to books that I want people to know about and bring attention to Alaska writers because uh, you know they're not all Alaska writers but the books have to have some connection to Alaska or the North as mm -hmm. you have, as you've noticed. Um, so I, it's part, I see it as part of my literary citizenship where I'm, you know, helping. And that's kind of where I am in my writing career now. I think of it that way. I'm not, I'm not writing that much these days. I'm, I'm, I'm working on several things, but I'm, I'm working on an anthology now, which will be, you know, promoting other writers. I'm, um, the teaching that I do, I see as really, you know, training younger writers and then the book reviews are all about promoting books and reading and writers so um it's it's a good good fit for me at this stage of where i am so and if we we could either have more questions and talk or i could read something short if you'd like i would really you like to hear one of your um Articles read by you. Thank you. Okay, I I always love um, hearing a, a, you know something read in a because it's then forever after when you read anything by a particular writer you'll hear that hear that voice. That's what I love. Mm -hmm. So okay, so I have two short pieces and one one is kind of a it's a place based piece um, set around Homer. It's kind of a serious uh, piece, kind of COVID related. And then the other one is a funny piece. So I would let you vote on which, which you would prefer. Oh. Preference. Well, I always like to leave on a good note. So maybe the funny ones. Okay. They're both, they're both good. They're both good notes, but um, I mean, they're both happy pieces, but yeah. So. Um, this is not this is not very new. It's a uh, it's several years old, um, but I've, I've I've read it in uh, occasionally. People seem to like it, and and it was it was published in um, uh, 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 what's the magazine that comes out in in Juno? The um, I mean not in Juno in Anchorage. Um, getting the name of it right now, not H U R, but the. Um, Anyway, it was published. So, okay, it's, ca it's called Beep. I had just returned from a trip when my bed partner warned me, my clock alarm has been going off every morning, even though I don't have it set. I don't know what the deal is. I said something about damn electronics, anything with electronic parts, which seems like everything these days, always too soon goes bluey, kablooey. At 7.45 in the morning, the alarm went off. Beep, 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 beep. It rang for half a minute and then quit. We are not alarm clock people. Our lives are such that we either wake naturally when we're rested or by internal abilities when required. We hate being abruptly jarred by loud and insistent noises. And if 7.45 is not a particularly early waking time, we claim the Alaskan right in winter to stay in bed until there's an edge of light in the southern sky. That night, he switched the alarms a.m. to p.m. That should fool it, he said. The next morning, beep, beep, deep, beep. The following night, he unplugged the clock altogether and left it on the kitchen counter. In the morning, the same beeping. 
think some of you are going to know what, what's happening here. It has a battery, I said. So even when it's unplugged, the battery keeps it alive and the door was open so the sound carried upstairs. What else could it be? Didn't you used to have a travel alarm? I shoved the mattress around and looked under and around the bed frame. That night, he disconnected the television and cable box and put all the TV and DVD remotes in another room. In the morning, more beeping. Get up, get up, I yelled. We have to find it. I flung myself across the room. It's here, somewhere on your side. I think it's on your side, he said. It's coming from my left. He was still lying in bed. This went on for a week. I became philosophical. It could be the cosmos talking, I suppose. It could be telling us we need to make the most of every day. No slothiness. He grunted and fell back asleep. Eventually, I thought, anything running on a battery has to wear out. We could live with it. We could simply outlast it. Several more grouchy mornings ensued. On a Saturday, I completely emptied the nightstand tables and bookshelves on both sides of the bed. I lifted the mattress, moved the bed, vacuumed up a few years of dust bunnies. I collected lost pens and dental picks and took away a box of obsolete VCR tapes. In my office on the other side of the wall, I searched drawers and put anything that looked vaguely electronic into the linen closet under, under piles of towels. The clock went there too. I wasn't convinced of its innocence. The next morning, the same beeping. His iPad was lying beside the bed. It's your iPad, of course it's your iPad. My iPad doesn't have a clock or an alarm. And besides, I usually leave it downstairs. It has to be your iPad. He spent an hour searching the iPad for a clock or alarm and then banished it from the room and closed the door. In the morning, again, the beeping, again, I threw myself from bed and scrambled around the room, racing the alarms 30 seconds. There was no question that the sound was coming from his side of the bed. Okay, I joked. Are you really a space alien? Are you implanted with something? Oh, I went into my office and Googled. In two seconds, I was reading, that little beep could be telling you something. He did indeed have an implant. It's called an ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. It was eight years old and he was scheduled to have it replaced in another month. As far as either of us remembered, no one had ever mentioned a low battery alarm. According to the manufacturer's website, the alarm was programmed to alert him when there were six months of battery life left. Just to be sure, the next morning at 7.45, he rose from the bed and left the room. The beeping went with him. The cardiologist's office was called. Morning peace returned. In the quiet dark, he and I snuggled close, and I thought about the cosmos's message. We have time. Time has us. We're awake or we're not, like clocks, like batteries, like beating hearts, will soon enough all come to the same still end. So how many of you knew what was happening there? No. No, no I don't. really? Didn't know that? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. There you go. It was funny. <laughs> we <threw> it. <laughs> How long did it take you guys? Like, to figure that, that out? Yeah. I didn't think it was a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine you tearing apart the room trying to find what's possibly making that sound. <laughs> No, it just we, we had we had no idea. No one had ever said anything. We never read anything that 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 his device was going to be making noise. No, it had never occurred to us. And and he, uh, for some reason he he couldn't he couldn't associate with himself. He, he wasn't he was projecting it in different directions. I don't know. Well, I wonder if it's like because we hear our voices differently then people hear our voices. So I wonder if it's something like to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it is five o'clock. So um, it is time for us to leave. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us, Nancy. Um, and uh, the video will be available um, to watch uh, sometime tonight or tomorrow morning for members. 
Um, I really enjoyed uh, your excerpt you read. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you, you ever so much. Very Thank, you. Nice. Thank you very much, nice Nancy. Nice to meet you all. So. And, um, yeah, nice yeah. to connect. Okay.